People often ask, what is the will of God for me? What does God want to do in me and through me in 2024? Good question to ask, as, especially as you come up with New Year's resolutions and what have you. I want to give you some general principles that you can apply to your specific situation by looking at the life of Moses, the life and ministry of Moses, especially described to us in the book of Hebrews, in the Hall of Faith, chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 24. Let's cut to the chase. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking forward to the reward. Okay? In case you missed it, Hebrews chapter 11 Chapter 11, verse 24 through 26. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. All right. So what we see in... Moses is that he had his priorities straight. Though he had all of the riches of Egypt, the greatest nation of that day, at his disposal, he rejected all of that and rather chose as greater treasure, identifying with his own people, with God's people, and with Jesus. Identifying with God's people was identifying with Jesus. He considered the reproach of Christ greater worth. The reproach of Christ, not the riches of Christ, it says, it's saying here, but the reproaches of Christ. Reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Looking beyond the suffering to the reward. But the reproaches itself, because of the reward that is coming, because of the knowledge of God, it was worthwhile. Very similar, the Apostle Paul describes this same kind of thought. In chapter 3, verse 10 of the book of Philippians, the letter of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 10. Look at the way the Apostle Paul even more uh, deeply describes uh, Moses' thought process. That I may know, he says, I counted all the prestige, all the riches uh, uh, provided, the temporary pleasures of this world as scubula, dung. <laughs> That's what that means. And in verse 10, he says, why? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. And here is the reward, reward that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. What is the resurrection from the dead? The eternal condition, condition of perfection is what is being spoken of here. That through the sufferings, my identifying with Jesus in his suffering, that I may attain in greater measure the perfection, the maturity, the beauty of King Jesus in my life, that I may know him in experience. Woo! Knowing Jesus is life. Knowing Jesus is greater treasure than you could possibly, this world could possibly imagine. And for that, giving up this world, no brainer. That's what Moses realized. That's what the Apostle Paul realized. And that's what we must realize. Knowing Christ, we must realize that knowing Christ is greater treasure than whatever prestige that a school degree might get you. Whatever luxury and comfort and security that worldly treasure might achieve for you, knowing Jesus, the eternal, eternal value of that treasure, for that to give up anything temporary, no matter how beautiful, how great, how powerful, nothing. Scubula, dung. That's the mentality. That's given here. And with that, God used Moses greatly. In the beginning, God 
made it absolutely clear that this is what it was all about, I will be with you. I will be with you. I will be with you. And Moses understood this. Moses understood the treasure of knowing God. Because when it came to a point where God said, okay, uh, you guys are messing up way too much. I can't go with you. I will go in front of you. I will not go in your midst. Moses said, forget it. If you do not go up with us, don't take us up from here. That's how much he valued the knowledge the presence of God. And so God used him. With that understanding, God used him to display the beauty of Jesus in his life and ministry. One example, just one, is the time when the people were thirsty, so thirsty, and they complained against Moses, and ultimately they complained against God. Is God really with us? And When Moses was given directions to stand on the rock that represented God and strike the rock, he struck the rock and the waters flowed. What was the rock? In the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians, we are told that that rock is Jesus. That is the picture of Jesus being struck and living waters flowing. What a beautiful picture of the cross in Moses' ministry. May the Lord paint beautiful pictures of himself through you and me. But Moses wasn't always this perfect. Let me give you another incident. You You know that Moses was a murderer, right? Moses was a murderer. You want to emulate Moses' faith? <laughs> Moses was a murderer. Remember that? If you ever want to make Moses your hero, remember, he messed up really big time and he couldn't go into the promised land. Why? Very similar situation. God said, speak to the rock. People were thirsty and there was a rock. God said, speak to the rock this time. Moses had already struck the rock. The rock is Christ. The rock did not need to be struck again. But what does Moses do? He strikes the rock twice putting on a dramatic display and giving himself all of the credit because he was afraid that he would lose the attention of the people. The people would no longer look to him for leadership. So he, he utilized, he tried to use God's power to solidify his position. That was terrible. You see how wicked that was? And yet God provided water. That's just like God. He is so merciful. He is so faithful. Then what do you see? Moses' life and ministry is not about Moses. It's about God's faithfulness and the beauty of Jesus being displayed all throughout. It's all about Jesus. And may your will be all about Jesus. Okay, what are the takeaways from here? How do we find God's will in our lives? First of all, listen to the voice of God. Listen to the voice of God in his word. Have this word shape your mind. Second, get your priorities straight. (laughs) Look, in the light of heaven and the eternity that we we will spend in resurrection form with him forever, what is this life? If the Lord calls you to give up anything in this life for the sake of following him, for the sake of greater conformity to his purity, to his beauty, to his generosity, then it is a no-brainer, whether that be friends, whether that be opportunity, whether that be, whether that be hobbies. It's, a, it's nothing. If you can, in some measure, know him in experience. Are you ready to suffer? Are you ready to let go? Let go. You suffer loss of nothing at the end of the day. And finally, remember, you suffer nothing because you have everything in Jesus. He himself has said, I will never leave you and never forsake you. Jesus said, the Bible says that Jesus is the same. The one who said that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The whole Bible, like bookends, like the book of Matthew, begins with God with us and God with us forever in Jesus. And that is more than enough Just those three principles I want to leave with you. 
Have your mind shaped by the word of God to find the will of God. Get your priorities straight in the light of that word. And remember, as that word proclaims, Jesus is with you forever. The same yesterday, today, and for all of eternity. us to make the wise choice of choosing you over every proposed satisfaction offered us, even the proposed satisfaction of making our own choices. King Jesus, our wills we want to lay down before you. Give us your wisdom so that we may, with the power and grace you give, make choices that honor you that glorify you, that follow in your footsteps. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.